with that, we will head over to our next presentation of the day. We'll head over to Mikael and lessons learned. Welcome, Mikael, to Funkprog Sweden. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. So let me share my presentation. There we go. Does it work? Yes, it seems like it works. Cool. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about some lessons learned from Chrome Cloud. Uh, very briefly, the contents for today. First, I'll do a sh short intro, uh, talk about the good parts we experienced so far, some bad parts, some non-issues that I thought were going to be issues when we started out and spend the main focus for today on reflections on testing. So, uh, so I'm from Carbon Cloud. We are a clim the cl climate intelligence platform. We do climate calculations primarily for food. Uh, and we have our open, open source, uh, our open database for everyone uh, that are interested in climate performance that can go and check that out. Uh, so I'm Michael, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Carbon Club. And we have a uh, event source back in Haskell for all our applications, uh, aside from the some ML training, some ML training stuff, some science stuff, and the AWS uh, stack. But the main part of the, the application logic is uh, is in Haskell. Uh, our frontends are written in Elm, and we have some browser testing in pure in pure script as well. And we have uh, been working with these applications for uh, what's that like three three four years now, and so far it's working out great. So yeah. Uh, uh, we start with the last one, it seems. Um, yeah, so we have very few hard to reason about bugs. The, of course, we have bugs. Uh, there are not very many, but we have them. But often they are really, really easy to squash when they when they happen. Uh, but the first thing on our list, we are very happy with our choices. Um, when we started, that was both Haskell and Elm were not like the mainstream. Languages are still not, um, but uh, I would say I would do the same choices again uh, overall. Uh, uh, it's really stable. Uh, our applications and our changes, where it allows for us to iterate quite a lot, uh, both on the Elm and Haskell side with all the key benefits they have it's really easy to refactor the team is actually refactoring a big in, in, integral part of the application in our biggest application as we right now and improving that solving a few main shortcomings uh, we have done so several times um during the years and have no and had no major problems with that um uh, one Key thing is we have a really good performance out of the box without uh, without really needing to like optimize things in details. We have made some more systemic optimizations, uh, like changing how we the flow of the application or the calculation goes, which has improved performance. But in general, performance is nothing we have had. Uh, the need to focus on that much. It's been a few bottlenecks and we have had quite aggressive growth uh, when it comes to the both the uh, customers and uh, data in the platform. Um, so we still had to have a work with performance from time to time, but it's not a, a general thing then. Uh, so that's, that's good. Uh, it's a real joy to not having uh, some major problems like null checks and stuff like that, and just have have them removed by design, which is really neat. Uh, as I said, we use uh, event sourcing, 
which in my mind gives us superpowers. Uh, we can solve a lot of really difficult problems or that would be difficult in, in other setups, really easy. Of course, it's not a free lunch that adds some some fundamental complexity in uh, we need to work with you know butterfly butterfly effects when we change the projections of the, the vents and stuff like that. But in in general, I'd say that's uh, one of key things, uh, key decisions we made from day zero that has really benefited us. Uh, one thing, and this is more Haskell specific, but also uh, would apply to Elm, is that. Even if a package can be really, really old, like in software sense, like six years old or something, uh, they quite often still work. The problems they solve because, uh, and that, I think that is uh, a general theme with these uh, languages that uh, most, if not all things stay solved if, not, if you don't want to change it actively, uh, which is really, really nice. And I know each of these we could talk about at length, but I will go just go paint with a broad brush and then we'll go into the today's topic. Yeah, and of course, not not everything is is great. Uh, one thing when compared to more mainstream languages is there are fewer maintained packages for niche applications. I don't think we have had like any major roadblocks when it comes to missing packages. So I, I wouldn't say that it's a blocker, but it is, it's it's a comparative like difference, right? If you compare it to like uh, the .NET plat platform or Java, or whatever, or Node or whatever. Uh, so there are fewer packages. And especially if you go to int integrations with other services, um, or other platforms like SDKs and clients and stuff. There are fewer of those. Um, we, as I said, it's not been a hard blocker, but I have to uh, acknowledge that that is a that's a difference when it when we compare to mainstream languages. And co connected to that, like fewer turnkey solutions. For instance, if we set up a um, like uh, really easy to use SDKs for uh, for different yeah for like AWS there are few but they are they are few and maybe not all, always up to date for the different packages or not as battle tested in some cases as others so so, so and you have to like glue some pieces uh, together yourselves this is. I put it in bad, uh, and this is an Elm specific that, but it's not worse than anything else um, comparatively, like uh, uh, React Redux or something like that. It's just that the the benefits of Elm with the state, uh, without going into much detail, if you don't know Elm, it's it's a very opinionated uh both language and it's a language and framework in one it's very specifically tailored to do web applications and uh, you do it by having a viewer model and then updates and messages to uh so you, you something happens in, in the ui um it sends a message and then you have the logic or you push the button the counter button or, or uh, increase the counter with one and then it's it's re-rendered with a new counter value that loop doesn't work if you want to have a lot of animations because then if you if you use that loop you will be cpu bound and not you'll be able to use css3 in 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 that way I mean, it's you can do that, but you will do that outside that loop. So it doesn't make it worse than alternatives, but you don't get the full advantage of of them. So I wouldn't. So it's not. It yeah, it's not worse than others, but it's not as good as if you don't do the, do, do those things. Um, this is a Haskell specific one. As a, again, we have had very few or to squash bugs. We have especially one that was really difficult and it took a long time. 
to understand what happened and why. And it it was uh, for some events we had a cache when it talked to the database, and the first implementations were really easy and simple. Uh, but with a high throughput of the data, we got some race conditions and we couldn't understand why. And after a long time, we understood that it was, that this was a bug in the library. Uh, but to understand that and what was hap what happened when and why, what uh, what what was the bottleneck and stuff like that can be really tricky tricky when it, when you have lazy evaluation. Uh, but they are rare and far between. Uh, this is yeah. Bad concept. I said that the joy of not be able, the the joy of not having those concepts in other languages that I that I personally think it creates a lot of problems. If you simulate those in Haskell, you will still have the same problems. Uh, uh, like if you have a global state monad, we don't. But uh, or if you create an interface, for instance. It doesn't matter if you like create a mathematical nice framework or a monad above it. If the concept's still the same, it will generate the same problems. Even though it maybe be it's better, the fundamental problem's still there. Uh, but it's it's good because those concepts are quite. Um, you have to actively try to reconstruct those. So. So just because you do something in Haskell doesn't mean it's good if you try if you do this if you import the problems from another uh, uh, language or paradigm. Uh, a few things that I saw as risks or that I thought would be a problem when we go when we started this uh, when we took this choice and. Two things came to mind. I think maybe there are more, but one thing was the style of documentation, especially in Haskell, is if you compare it to other um, languages, it looks really bad. It's very, in most cases, very little information aside from the, the type signatures. And I thought that that would going to be a problem when we started to working with new libraries and stuff. Turns out that is a totally non-issue, at least for us, because the types are so important and tell so much. So I find it much easier doing it that way. Uh, so now when I if I do a small like scripting thing in Python or Node uh, to do some import or stuff, and I use a library. I tend to see the nice human language documentation to be just in the way, and I try to find the actual meat. Okay, what is the parameters and what's the behavior? So that's been a known issue. The other one I also mentioned because it seems to be a big thing that many uh, are a roadblock. Many people like encounter when they try to introduce these types of um tools in the workplace i've heard it from several people is uh it's uh, the hiring would be so difficult for us it hasn't uh, i would say of course there are fewer than mainstream languages um so in numbers it's much harder but uh in the outcome or the how much have we been working to work to get good hires uh i would say it's the same and I would say that the the average level of competence of the people that apply are much higher. So I wouldn't say that hiring is a factor when it comes to this, the choice of using Haskell or Elm or, or something like that. Cool. Uh, so with that, and again, all of those points before we could talk quite at length about, but I wanted to focus a bit on testing. And there is um, there's a lot of things to say about testing. First of all, I, I think it's 
uh, for us, it's really important that things work as intended. Uh, we put quite a lot of effort into that. You can do, you can ensure that in different ways. And I want to present one way to think about it. I, I, I don't um, propose that's the only way uh, to think about this, but I think it's a, a tool at least. When you, because you, we, when you have finite resources, you want to put your put them where it matters most. So, I will go through some concepts and then some uh, and some tools, and then we're going to put it all together to see and present why I think working with languages with really strong type systems are really important and helps us in a commercial sense and a business sense. And I think it's a, a benefit and a advantage to do so if compared to, uh, to other uh, or other choices. Uh, yeah, so this um, one thing that I as a person likes about Haskell, there, there's a lot of uh, rigorous thinking to solve problems. Uh, but also I think that can come in the way sometimes because most of us, me included, just want to use uh, use the tools and languages to produce cool things, right? So uh, I will try to not to focus on rigorous definitions and stuff like that, but I will still want to explain a few concepts to convey the fundamental idea, hopefully. So I will be... If if you if you have a lot of background in, in these areas and think uh, thinks I'm a I'm not as precise as I should be in some places uh, I uh, you are right, but I th I think it helps this uh, rather, rather than hurt it. So first off, it's called the uh, cardinality, and that is the number of different unique values something can have, uh, meaning. Um, you can think of it if you have a switch statement or a, a case of statement, it's the number of, if you want to uh, uniquely pattern match on each uh, value that uh, uh, that thing can have, how many state uh, rows do you need to match on? So a bool has a cardinality of two because it can be either true or false. There are no other values. And a string has the conceptual cardinality of like it's an infinite range, right? Because you can always add another um, letter and continue that, and all of those will be unique. And uh, either uh, bool bool, uh, meaning, and uh, either is uh, either it's uh, 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 left and true or false or right or true or false. So that's a cardinality of four. The four different unique states. And if you have, if you want to test something, it has a function, the higher kernality it has, the more demanding to test it will be. Meaning that if you have a function that takes no argument, you and if, if it's pure, it, it, now we're talking about only pure functions, meaning functions that doesn't work with side effects. Um, then if you have no, if you have zero arguments, then you know you need only to write one test, right? Because you're always gonna get the same same value. And you, you, so, and if you have a function that has only a bool as input, then there's only two tests that needs to be written, right? And if you have a string and you want to test that completely, you if you just do it the most naive way, you want to test, okay, if I uh, call function X with a with the input of A and then B and C and then A, A and B, B and et cetera, then you will, since the string has a cardinality of uh, infinite cardinality, you will have to write an uh, infinite amount of tests, right? To, if you want to test it completely. So cardinality is one concept. 
And one, the one, other one is arity is simply the number of arguments to a function. Uh, this is ignoring the language implementation, uh, but uh, as a mathematical sense or the, how it, the things are perceived. So if you have the function add, it takes two numbers and add them together. It's an average of two because it takes two arguments. And again here, and I think that it will be, feels quite intuitive, um, is that the higher everything else equal, the higher higher arity numbers or the higher arity of a function, uh, the harder it will be to test. Because if you have uh, only one bool as input, you have two 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 different uh, paths to go down. But if you take hundred bools, right, you have a lot of different combinations that can yield different types of results. Uh, so if you if you if, when we combine those two, it's they are the the behaviors is in a very precise uh, specific way. So if we want to calculate the total cardinality of a function, it's the product of the cardinality of all parameters. Meaning, if you have have the if you have a function that takes two boots, then you have one bool can be in two different states, but for each uh, value uh, of the first, it can be two for the other. So it's four, right? So if we have add and assuming uh, 32 bits integer, we have uh, uh, two, two, two to the power of 32 times two to the power of 32, which is pretty large, right? So in this sense, the arity affects the total calendar a lot since if we add, uh, um, let's say the either has two cases, it could be either left or right. If we add uh, a third option there, then it will be only increased by one, right? But if we add another parameter, we're going to uh, the kernel the will increase by taking this, uh, the product of those two things. Um, and here I can say that the there is no when it when it comes to cardinality there is doesn't matter how the data is structured in language if it's uh, if it's a function that just take one one value after the other or if it takes one thing that is a record with ten ten things. That doesn't really matter, right? Because the total cardinality will be the same. You have just reshuffled, reshuffled those ten, ten values into a single record. But the the total um, different permutations the input can have is still the same. And again, here, so with the higher the total cardinality, the more to test. Um, this can all, all this can also be done a good tool when refracting types. If you do something and the cardinality changes, then you have changed the behavior. Since if you want to, uh, or then at least you most uh, you mostly have not intended to. Uh, you most likely have made a change you haven't intended. Um, so that could be a good way if you have a more complex type and you want to rearrange things, for example, from a nested record and we want to flatten it, then the cardinality will uh, will stay the same. If you do if you don't do some kind of mapping between the different uh, uh, types, but that is a that's a like corner case. So we have uh, a total. Uh, cardinality and the cor the basic correlation is the higher the cardinality the more effort we need to 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 put into testing if we want to be ensure it makes the correct things right so i don't really like this uh, headline but uh, like correcting tools like things or activities or tools that we can use to ensure that the program does what we want to do. Uh, there are a lot of different things. This, this is not a, I won't I won't present a ex, uh, like a ex exhausting lists 
here, but we can do example based tests, uh, which is just like add three and two should equal to five. You just take a specific permutation of the inputs and say that th with this input, I want this behavior or this output. We can have property based tests. And in this case, add X and Y should equal to add Y and X. I'll go into each of these specific uh, individually, uh, but I just want to uh, throw them out, out there at the start so we can. Uh, or we could avoid uh, the need to test that particular thing, right? And here we could do a lot of different things. We could throw out the implementation <laughs> and if the feature is not needed, or if we can find a way to make that step don't that so we don't need to do that compute. Or we can change the implementation to make the test irrelevant. And what that means, so we're going to talk about more later. So example-based tests uh, corresponds, I think, closely to what people think of when they hear the term unit tests. But I think that more specific, for me, uh, more specify the level of where we're in the in the application you tests or a test or what kind of scope you aim to cover with the test. Um, so that's why I, I use this example based test um, um, title instead, just to make sure in, when you compare to other types of tests. Instead of you can do, you can do a example based test on like system level or API level, or you can do it on a function, right? all the principles will still be valid that I will go through. So uh, example-based test is like add three and five should be eight, if I, my math is correct. So a benefit is that it's really specific, right? You as a, as a developer or a AI, if you use that to write your test, uh, specify a specific permutation and can say that regardless how the implementation looks like, I want this as a specific uh, outcome. Um, so it's very specific and concrete. You can see, is does this, um, is this correct? I don't need to go up an abstraction and try to, to, to ex explain uh, the behavior in a more gener generic or uh, abstract way. I can say that with this input, I want this output. And I think it's quite easy to start writing these because you don't need to have uh, create a fully like uh, complete model of the domain or something. You just know that I don't I don't know the what the correct answer to all permit permutation of the input is, but I at least I know with this input I want this answer. So it's 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 a you only need to have one. To, to figure out your you want the behavior in one instance, right? Uh, the weakness of this is that as the cardinality go up, pro the the I, I mentioned coverage here is doesn't necessarily to be true, but like the how much you can trust that if your tests are green, does does it still work? Goes down, right? Because if you have only two possible inputs and you have a test for one, then at least you have to cover 50%. But if you have uh, a cardinality of 10,000 and with one test, it doesn't save that much potentially. And as um, like post fact, if you go back to test later, uh, it can it can be sometimes hard to understand the intent. Why is this that the the um, this example based test does that does this um, example try to capture a general idea that um, that we exemplify? With, with this test or is it more that yes at least i know that this input should generate this output right so the 
what, what, what the intent was with the test um, can be hard to gauge sometimes. And also that can matter because if you do, uh, if you do a change and something breaks, um, then you need to figure out if your implementation is wrong, probably, or if you may change the behavior so that that example is not really valid anymore. Um, next thing, let me check where I'm at in time here. Yeah, so I will uh, increase the pace a bit, I think. Um, yeah, so the next one is like property-based tests. There are a lot of names for this. Uh, fast test, there's a, a famous library called QuickShake. Um, fuzzy testing. I think property-based tests is a bit of a misnomer. It's it's in part a really good name, and I, I think, and but also it's a pro problematic because I think it can hinders the understanding of what you're actually doing. So the um, uh, like if you don't know what property-based tests are is that you try to, as I showed before, is you said that if you have the function add, you try to describe a property, for instance, that add x and y, no matter what the values of x and y, should be the same as adding y and then x, right? Um, and then you, don't, you haven't specified what x and y is, but you know that that, that, that should always be true. And which is good. It's a good way to think about a problem, uh, but it doesn't actually test those properties. It uses that uh, that description of the property and generates uh, example-based test and run those examples with. And it generates a lot of them and you can do them quite, uh, to do it quite smart uh, and to find a lot of problems. But uh, uh, it's a, 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 a Maybe a, a small difference, but in practice, that is a really uh, have a quite great impact. So the benefits of a property-based test is that I really like it because, um, as you see, there it creates a, a, a another perspective. You have, you have. I think there are several different perspectives you can have. You can have with this input, I want this output, right? The behavior. If I do this with my, my machine, I want it to spit out these numbers, which is, is which is great. The other perspective that I think is really powerful is uh, with the types, right? You can say, okay, I want this to be like an integer or a string, and then I have a compiler that enforces that, so that is always true, right? So I can reduce the space. And another way to think about that is. I reduce the cardinality of that value, right? Because instead of being ev be being everything at once, it's only this thing. But if we if we think about properties, I think there's another uh, way to think about the problem, which I think is really helps to both the creativity and also a good uh, tool to in the process of understanding the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a good good tool to reason about the problem, and it can also capture the intent in in a good way because it's it's really clear that I I want the code to have this property, and of course you can add a lot of more rigorous both uh, terminology and uh, uh, both tools and thinking in into that to express those properties in a very rigorous way if you want to, or you can just say that uh, add X and Y should be the same as adding Y and X because the, the order doesn't matter, which is, which is great. And this way it can reduce uh, in some way is some scenarios greatly reduce the number of tests that needs to be maintained and changed or updated. Some weaknesses. Uh, again, here since we don't actually test the properties directly, uh, we use a, a some uh, framework or a library that generates example-based tests, 
we have the same same problem, right? When the currency uh, goes up, if let's say we have a type that can be in have thousand different values, so the currency is one thousand. Uh, if I generate eight hundred tests or nine hundred tests, and they all pass, I think I, we can be quite. Uh, or 999 tests, then we'll be quite uh, happy that, okay, probably it will work, right? But if we have a type that could have, a, that has a cardinality of 10 million, as this system work, we will probably still generate a few hundred or a few thousands different example-based tests every time you run the tests, which means that the you will test very thin slice uh, of all possible different values, meaning that you don't really know if that property holds anymore. You want you express it as uh, uh, you have shown your intent, but that is not actually what ha what happens. This can go that, in a se sense, the the higher the character goes up, the more the uh, expressed tests lie, right? Uh, because and that's a good thing about the example based test because usually they only say with this input I get I should get this output and I do they don't try to say anything else or they shouldn't try to say anything else but with this it they say uh, these functions are have these properties um, and that test are is green you will. It's 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 easy to start thinking that 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 protection is as good as a, the compiler, for instance, which is not. And at the same time, if if you have very low cardinality, it's potentially not especially useful because if if you only take two, if you only have a, a bool as input, uh, the need of generating these. Uh, a lot of different example-based tests are greatly reduced. Of course, they can still be a good way to think about the problem, right? What, what kind of, if we add, if you increase the kernality in the future, maybe this, the process will still hold. So low kernality doesn't automatically means that fuzzy testing or property-based testing are, is useless, but um, there is some risk that is not. Um, and also, I don't know, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's not enough to only have property-based tests because you still need some example-based tests to both as a sanity check and also uh, if you take add, for instance, for instance, it's, or maybe it may not add, but if you take a, a, uh, arbitrary um, function, it, it can be possible that even though if all your properties are true, uh, it's always generated the same answer, for instance, or something like that. So, But if you have good properties and a handful of example based tests, you have coming a lot, a lot longer than just the property based tests. Um, yeah. So we have the example-based tests that have their benefits of being very concrete and uh, specific, but uh, both intent and the test very little, right? And then we have the property-based tests that expresses the wanted behavior in some in properties, which is good. It helps us reason about the problem. Uh, but the best test as the best code is the test that we don't need to write. And I mean, one way is just to have basic types. If we have an integers and string, as I said before, we if you say that some, something is an integer, you already reduce the cardinality by a lot, right? From infinity to two to the power of 32, right? So that's one way to avoid needing to run uh, write tests. If you take a very dynamic language, which has their benefits uh, as well, but then if you have a function called add, if you if you if the inputs can be anything, you need to okay if the first 
parameter is a string, what do I do then? And then the, if the other one is a number, uh, and so on. Then you have a lot of lot of tests if you want to to ensure and decide uh, the wanted behavior. So you could either scrap the code, uh, just remove it, and of course that is easy, easy to say that. Oh, uh, that here is metrics uh, is important. Um, if something is never used, you can think about should we. This, does this bring value? Maybe people just don't find it, or. But I think the more 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 pragmatic or more useful uh, way of thinking about scrapping code is to think think about the algorithm or the pipeline that we have that solves the problem. Can we remove this step by? by by looking at the problem from a different uh, way or having the data structure um, in a different way. For instance, if you have, take a very naive ex example, if you have a list um, uh, with objects and each object has an ID and then some uh, sales state, for instance, and you only want to have uh, ensure that you have one ID. You can have write a lot of tests on the, that output that list, right? But if you if you get a dictionary instead or a hash map, you know that the, with the ID as the key, then you know that that's going to be true. Another way is to reduce the cardinality. If you have a function that takes in more than it needs, then you will have a much higher cardinality. Um, you can think about what what do I need and what do I don't do not need, and also the cardinality of even if you have the same number of parameters, can I express the digit or valid values in another way. And this is another way to say, okay, can you increase the types or have stronger types? And what I think what stronger type means in a often and in a more general sense is that you have a type that lowers the cardinality the most uh, so if you want you want to add restrictions to what kind kind of values your thing can be right you you restrict the of all possible things you can represent this only can be in this space. And you want to have that as small as possible. And of course, here come here is why why I personally think I have a strong, very strong type system is really important. And you, you can uh, when you can use uh, proofs in uh, other way uh, in, in different ways. This is a great in great library in Haskell called GDP. Goes to the part of proofs. I won't go into it here, but regardless of how you do it, the great thing about this library is that you can um, uh, help the um, the type system where where the type system fails. For instance, Haskell has a much uh, better type system than many languages, but I say it still has a lot of. Um, um, shortcomings or a lot, yeah. Um, when it compares to what, what I would wish it would would be able to do, and that uh, G the GDP library is a really good tool to bridge that. And the cost of the stronger types, if you want to increase how strong a type is, is very language dependent. And so, if you have, of course, if you have a system that is non-typed. Uh, if you take JavaScript, for instance, oh, it that has a uh, at least a few one type. Uh, but if you want to add, add layers on, on top of that, uh, it's since it's not uh, like designed from that from the start, you have to maintain those layers, you know, in a way. But e e even if you have a language that have that has a compiler and uh, and types, um, then that compiler could be not very uh competent and then of course if you want to do more than just having this is a string and this is a list 
then it can be quite costly. Uh, and with cost, I mean both uh, maybe runtime cost, but also how much hassle and how much boilerplate it takes to generate and maintain these types and how easy it is to use them as a developer. And how much does using those techniques in that language impedes on understanding the code and so stuff like that. Uh, for instance, in in most typed functional programming language to, to create a type is a one-liner if it's a simple type. Um, a lot of best practice in um, if it's like C sharp, if you have um, like linters and stuff, they want each like class in their own file, and there's a lot of boilerplate, and you need to, of course, it uh, some things can be done, but they are generally more costly. And this, I won't dwell on this, but yes, this is if you just take. Uh, and of course, it's easy to take JavaScript as an example. I, uh, I kind of like um, in certain areas uh, as well. So I'm not a hater. I will never write the application with it, but it has its uses. So this is not my example. I found it from a quick image, uh, quick, quick search. Um, but here it has like implicit uh, uh, co um, conversions that generates uh, interesting results. And what I want to highlight here is that if you have a value, let's say the first one that is a string that is five, depending on what happens, it's it can actually be both a string and a, a number. So the canonality goes up in a sense, even if it doesn't do that in uh, a more theoretical since since uh, string has uh, infinite uh, canality, you can argue that it doesn't. But in practical terms, I would say that it does. Uh, another uh, uh, example is that we're going to go through a few iterations. So if you have an e email input, so you want to have an email, you could the first example here, type email input equals to string, is to say that email input is another word for string. Uh, meaning that in the, this is for our text box and in a hypothetical application in the front end. So a uh, uh, person have typed their, their input, their email into a box. Or, um, but then you want to have a validate, you want to validate if you're going to do submit, you only want to have a valid email. So you, you can create a new type that takes either is a valid email and there's a string and then an invalid email and then a string. But you see the, here we see that both valid emails and invalid email takes up the same space. They have the same cardinality and have a total overlap over the values. So if we have uh, have a value of string, we have no idea of telling where it should belong. So we could do another thing, say, okay, we have valid email, and then it's email, whatever that means. And that means that we have shrunken, instead of having all strings, perhaps we have a type that ensures that it's contained, uh, if, uh, that it follows the rules for email or an invalid email that is a string. The problem is that a string contains all valid emails. Uh, so the last one we could do to really make sure that the types are different depending on what we want to do with it, is either we have an email or an invalid email, meaning that in the type, if we have the type uh, instance of the type or a value of the type of invalid email, that can never be a valid email. And I think this helps if, because the next step and the step after that, when we want to do something with the values, we we really reduce the number of things we need to test because if you have uh, uh, want to email to these things or whatever, um, we don't need to have a check in that function, check if this is a valid email because we know that because of the input. So we don't have to write a test. What should the behavior be if email is 
uh, is invalid or whatever. And this is my totally scientific thing, but uh, this tried to capture this. So we have on the y-axis, we have the cost of uh, the cost of doing it. And on the x-axis, have the knowledge capture or the the how strong the types are. So if you go to the right, the the strength of the types increases. Uh, but if you go up, the the cost of doing those things are uh, are uh, increases as well. And I think these this is the reason why I like Haskell and Elm, and of course Idris, and we have more very niche languages like I and Cook as well that can really have express a lot without having the costs going to to the roof and of course haskell uh if you want to push it very very far or uh, further than all the other languages it starts to get really ex expensive as well so if we try to put it all together i, I would say that if we have um if we have, uh, if we write example-based tests, uh, oh, for before we get, okay, this input does it does it have the correct uh, cardinality? Can we reduce it? And then, could this example be expressed as a property? That's something. Okay, do we try with this example-based test trying to capture a property? Then maybe we should write a property-based test. But also, if we have a property. Could that be expressed in the types? Because then we wouldn't have the need of this test. Then we then then, then we don't have, have uh, then we don't need to write it. So if we follow these steps, it creates a bit of a Goldilocks zone for the property based tests, uh, and that is if it's useful enough. But it's hard; it's too costly to to add it to the types, right? Because if, if it's cheap to add it to types, that is better because then we don't have to maintain the test, and the compiler will enforce it hundred uh, percent. So we have that as a tool when the cost of expressing a type, or if if the compiler we have cannot do that, or the cost becomes too high, whatever your uh, tolerance for that cost is. However, even if it's outside that go locks on, it's that we still have other benefits of just thinking about the properties from that perspective, right? Even it doesn't matter where we test to enforce that to just have that mindset when you when you start with the problem uh, can be good. And a, and a combination, uh, each type gives some advantages. Uh, I can just say for us historically. We have all, we, we have example-based tests and property-based tests and, and, and a lot of things in the types. But I would say that we have, uh, we have captured a lot of the type in the types. And we have a lot of example-based tests to ensure that, especially on the API level, to, me, to say that oh, the JSON should be, look exactly like this. Um, and more like scenario based testing, testing as well. But it leaves that uh, we have a few, much, much fewer property based tests because we have pushed it over the edge uh, continuously to the types, right? But some, some things are too, too expensive uh, or the Haskell has uh, uh, not, not good enough type system to, to capture that in a good, in a good way. Uh, so, Another thing, key point that cardinality is important, both for implementation sake, but also for testing. And if we reduce the cardinality, we reduce the need for tests. And the stronger the type system, the more the cardinality can be reduced. If we have, if we have a type system that can express this is a list, or a, and we go from there to a non-empty list or we go from to having a list with uh, an even number of elements for some reason, right? So each time we do one of these steps that the current is reduced and we, we reduce the number of tests. And 
the the strongly type system in general sense, the lower the cost is as well. So we can do we can use this tool more. Yeah. So that was it. So we have questions. Much Mikael. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very nice. Let's see. I haven't got any questions so far in the chat, but I'll um, start shooting away questions to you. Yep. Um, did you consider any other languages when you started up the, your company and your solution? Or maybe you yes. started with some and then went to Haskell Elm or... Yes. So I, 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 before in my career, I've worked with a lot of different languages. Uh, yes, before this company, I worked with in the .NET uh, like thing, and I was I knew that I didn't want to work with that <laughs> to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, and I wanted as strong as possible a type system, but I wanted still to be pragmatic and working in a a real world solution, uh, like real world setting, right? And the truth is, there wasn't really many contenders. There, there was. Like uh, I looked at the GVM uh, to have some languages. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not very, there are some uh, communities uh, that, with that, that have like ported Haskell, but there's not very active. So when it comes to the back end, there was not really, I evaluated a, a few others, but uh, Haskell was the, I think, the most pragmatic of the 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 more uh, competent languages. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to front end, I think uh, I think there is no better choice out there. Um, it's so because it's really focused as a language, right? It's it's try it says in in I it's to create uh, front end applications, and it's really opinionated. But I think everyone. That I met that is that won't that works on the front end is really really productive in it, so that was a much easier choice. Um, of course, none of those languages and, and communities are perfect, but they are. I think they're uh, especially they are a lot of better, a lot a lot better than many others. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then did you get any questions from your um, uh, investors or point of view on the language you selected? They were like, Haskell, we never heard of it. Will you find developers? Yeah. Or did they care at all? Or No, when I, when we started up, I wrote like, uh, I wrote down my my analysis and the reason to go why we should go with the functional uh, languages. And it it's boils down to that I think the developers or the product department or engineering department or whatever you want to call it should be a business enabler to be able to gen create business opportunities. And I think uh, that using strong types does that best. So I, so I, yes, I, I, I wrote it, but mostly for myself because it's, uh, it was a non-trivial decision right it's, it's since it's not mainstream uh i felt that i really should think about it before before going ahead since uh, it's quite a lot of money and a lot of people's time that we we all invest in this to make this fly and in our case i think um uh, what we work with it's really important that we succeed for like the climate and all the other factors so i didn't take it lightly so I, I generate a few an analysis documents, but mostly for my own uh, sake. Mm -hmm. Would you redo any technical choice today? Like if you could back up and say, okay, with this experience now, I would choose some, you know, something else. Or would you go with the yeah. setup you have today? No, I, I think that has surprised me the most. I mean, we have changed a lot when it comes to inner dynamics. And as I said, we have rewritten stuff several times and uh, again right now the the teams are working with sh like changing one major like core part of the application but when it comes to the main pillars like haskell event sourcing and elm mm. if you take those pillars, mm. uh the answer is no i think they work really really well uh would i 
like there to be a new like Haskell two or that some other uh, other modern alternative came up. Yes, I would. Uh, I don't. I, I don't think. I think Haskell is far from perfect, but I think it's much better than uh, a lot of other things. Yeah. You know, maybe you mentioned it, but which database do you use? I mean, it's not. It's not we use for, Postgres. Postgres. For yeah. So we, we don't we have uh there is like event source specific ones we don't use those mm -hmm. uh that that is not uh for once that we that we have a few parts that are not event sourced uh which have created, those are the parts that have created headaches for us so we have removed them over time but also we we used to, we started with Postgres it was just that start simple um so that is not the result of long uh, like a, a a proper analysis of should we go with uh, like event source based database uh, yeah. to be truthful um event sourcing i mean it's it's i love the concept uh, and you can use it i mean it doesn't matter right really <laughs> what type of programming language you use you can <laughs> event source your... yeah. exactly was there any like did you have any issues with your dev team to 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 for people to grasp that or did it come naturally as they came from functional or they're into functional programming event sourcing would be because i because i tend myself to find when i work with the database or database people they see it like you create this record you change it you know it's mutable they yeah. going yeah. into this like no 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 we create, you know <laughs> for every instance we create new yeah so i think for us of course, we have a selection bias when we have hired that that, that helps this. But <laughs> but for us, the, the the there's in these three pillars. Mm -hmm. I think there is there is some synergy or like that hooks into each other that makes it uh, like fit really well together. Yeah. Uh, if I will come back to the database shortly, but as like the if you start with the front end, mm -hmm. we have this uh, conceptual loop in the we have the view uh, we have the state that is. Um, Connected to uh, a view, and the view generate messages to update the state, mm. right? And the neat thing with is when we zoom out and have the front end as the view, we generate commands to the to the back end, which up then with that calculates a new state that we send to the front end. So we actually have more or less the same loop when it comes to the front end stuff or for the web application stuff. Uh, in like in several different like abstractations or like uh, both when you, when we look at the um, system as a more as a whole or in the individual part of the front end, mm -hmm. and that makes that hook into very neatly with with event sourcing because we have a command that generates an event and we have a list of events, and both. Uh, Elm and Haskell, like immun immutability is a really big part there. So we have taken that uh, further. And also like in our in our field, like audibility is really important uh, and who made what, where, and we get that uh, all that for free. So I think since immutability uh, is a, was a really key part of what we do, then those choices fit fit really well together. And when it comes to the functional functional program minds, I mean, if we have peep like fold or stuff like that, it, like in a very naive or like essential way, the event sourcing is just a fold over over the events, right? So it's again, it fits really well with that with with, with that uh, paradigm. Mm -hmm. How come you came into functional programming? You mentioned you worked with .NET before. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I worked with uh, .NET and Python and a bunch of other languages as well in different, and PHP for a, mm. a, like a long time ago. <laughs> and I think it was it's, it's several different ways uh, reasons. One was I worked a lot of with processes uh, in in some of my where I worked. Uh, even though it started with, with technical choices, it always came back to processes because, okay, now how do we want this to work like our internal? Uh, and to take, take a very concrete example, where we started with F-sharp in another place, in F-sharp, 
you can do side effects wherever you want, right? It's um, one key th good thing about uh, F Sharp is a good gateway because you can just start you start like incorporating functional ideas like piece by piece. But also that means that you can't really trust if you have add X and Y if that is pure or not. You don't know that. So then we uh, said, okay, maybe put all the pure thing in a in a folder called pure, and then all. But then you have a, a process problem because then we everyone everyone, everyone need to follow that, and over time that is unmanageable. So to avoid having those problems, to avoid having to deal with things like uh, we okay, how should we deal with null or how should we do deal with this? So I have a strive to remove those problems entirely in us on a systemic level. And I think that drive what's drove me to stronger and stronger types. Um, and of, and currently functional programming language are the ones with strongest types and best compilers. So I think for me, those things are more important um, than, than it's functional. But uh, if you have those things, I think Functional programming is uh, like a natural thing to jack in because a lot of other things doesn't don't work with immu immutability and really strong types. True. Um, last question: Have you used quick check? Have yeah, you, uh, in the current pro, I mean, in your current uh, in, in the current solution, or have you used quick check? Yes. Before? Let's see. So I can, uh, but yes, and I can't remember now if we use. Um, Currently, we use HSpec with quick check together for the property based test. Yes, so uh, for the property based test, I think of we course. use quick check. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Interesting. Again, thank you very much, Mikael. Uh, there's no more questions. People are shouting in the chat. Great presentation. So thank you very much, Mikael, again. And thank you, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. With that, thank everyone, you. thanks for tonight. Thanks for joining. Thanks for all your questions and your engagement in the chat and on the Discord channel. Uh, we'll see you all again on 23rd of May. So with that, have a nice evening or day wherever you are. Goodbye. <laughs>